<laughs> Thank you, Pastor, for that beautiful prayer, lifting our spirits to God, the worship team for singing the great song, the opportunity to share. I am uh, one of those guys that, uh, when it comes to trying to preach a message, and I've been doing this for many, 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 many years. I always write everything out. Well, Andy just stole my thunder, Pastor Andy. <laughs> she preached my sermon. I should cut at least an hour off the service. You know. <laughs> Actually, uh, let's see what we can do. I'm going to read a few verses from Acts 12 this morning. The whole setting are the first 19 verses of that chapter. And uh, much of the story that she depicted on the stick man drawing and <coughs> she gave is here. But I think another thing I like to do sometimes is when there is such a familiar story that everyone kind of responds to and understands, I like to read it from a different perspective. So I'm going to give those verses to you from Peterson's message this morning beginning with verse 1, chapter 12 of the Acts. King Herod got into his head to go after some of the church members. He murdered James, John's brother, and when he saw how much it raised his popularity ratings with the Jews, he arrested Peter. All this during Passover week, mind you, and had thrown him in jail, putting four squads of four soldiers each to guard him. He was planning a public lynching after Passover. All that time, Peter was under heavy guard in the jailhouse. The church prayed for him most strenuously, or some say earnestly, they were praying. And then the time came for Herod to bring him out for the kill. But that night, even though shackled to two soldiers, one on either side, Peter slept like a baby, and there were guards at the door keeping their eyes on the place. Herod was taking no chances. What a paranoid guy. <laughs> Sixteen centuries guarding doors to there. Well, let, let me I'll come back to the scripture here in a little bit, make application as I can, but let me just depart a moment from that and mention to you that after one year at the University of Kentucky, I was still 18 years old, I married Edna. We've been married all of our lives. And three days after I turned 20, our first son was born. Now I knew nothing about taking care of an infant baby. But since Edna was working, I was working, it fell my lot to get up in the middle of the night to take care of that little guy. I was scared to death. But you know, I discovered some things along the way after three children and about two, four, six grandchildren that babies have certain reflexes, certain God-given reflexes. Reflexes to protect them, reflexes to provide for them. For one thing, I discovered that they have automatically a sucking reflex. You don't have to teach them to nurse. Almost as soon as they're born, they can nurse. They have a sucking reflex. Another thing I discovered was that they have a startle reflex. And that's a reflex that causes them to react and causes you to react. If somebody throws something at you, you dodge. You throw your hands up, you blink your eyes. It's a startle reflex. Well, that's the physical world. What about the spiritual world? Have you ever been startled by God? Have you ever looked back over something in your life and say, He was there all the time. I now see His fingerprints. I understand that God was at work in my life. And let me just parenthetically say that whatever dilemma, whatever you face today, whatever challenge is in your life, whatever may be occurring that is dragging you back and defeating you, God is at work right now in your life. 
and he may startle you with the realization of that answer someday along the way. We'll turn the page as fast, okay? I won't get into this story much, but the scriptural application, this is, this is really what happened here in chapter 12. The church is startled by God. Now, most of us have never experienced a crisis quite as severe as Peter was facing. Now, I'm not putting down any crisis, <laughs> anything that comes to us. Uh, but, but in that day, being a Christian was a dangerous vocation because the Surgeon General that day, named King Herod, had said being a Christian is dangerous to your health. It's not politically correct. Well, anyway, as you heard from the story er earlier, James was martyred, and it pleased the people, the Jewish people, and boosted the king's ego so much that he also had Peter arrested, and he was being saved, as the story goes in the scripture, until the Jewish <laughs> Passover feast holiday was over, and then they were going to take him out and kill him likewise. Well, now Peter's situation was at least as bad as any situation I can think about. He was in jail. He had his wrists, his waist, whatever, his ankles chained. He was, he was incarcerated between two burly soldiers, sentrymen, whatever you want to call them, guards. <coughs> And not only that, this was his last night on planet Earth. He knew that in the morning he was going to die. He was going to die. Now, I, I don't know what you may be experiencing today. And I don't want to minimize anything that's happening in your life. You may be going through transitions that are challenging for you. May have been a hard year financially for you. Maybe that your relational world is in chaos in some way. Perhaps even there are serious challenges in your marriage and you just find yourself sort of cohabiting together. Uh, you're wondering how you can make it any longer. Maybe you're scared to death about your children growing up in a world like we have with so many influences that will drag them aside. Or perhaps your kids are already grown, they're out of the house, and your heart's breaking because you know they're making decisions and choices that are not right, but your hands are tied. You feel out of control. No way to respond. I know some of you today are facing physical challenges. Maybe your families are away from God. I don't know what predicament you may be in today. I don't know what difficulty, what burden, what load you're carrying in your life today. And sometimes we carry those to where we feel so desperate that we're beyond believing that there could be any real help. We feel trapped. Well, what happened? What did the church do? Well, the church went to prayer. How did they answer these dilemmas that they were facing with Peter in jail? They went to prayer. That's one thing they did. Now, Pastor Denise taught us a wonderful lesson last week on prayer. Earnest prayer, sincere prayer, strenuous prayer. They weren't praying, and now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. They were pleading with God. They were in earnest with the Lord. They, if you've ever engaged in strenuous prayer, fervent prayer, you understand what I'm talking about today. You know, I, I think it's wonderful that we pray. So the church prayed. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I think most of us pretty much have that part down. When we're facing a big dilemma, when we're facing something that's too big for us, when we don't know the answer to whatever might be out there, our prayer life's pretty good. I have to admit to you that when I'm in a bind, my prayer life has never better. But it's okay. We talk to God about our challenges. We talk to God about our crisis. And so the church goes to prayer. What else does the church do? Well, let's look at Peter for a minute. In that damp, dark, dirty dungeon, I can imagine, surrounded by surly guards, chained from hand to foot, knowing full well last night on the planet Earth he would be there. 
knowing that he was going to be killed the next day, what would you do if you were in that situation? Would you cry? Would you have regrets? Would you say things like, where are you, God? How can I get out of this predicament? What did I do to deserve being here? Would you try to bargain with God? God, if you let me out of here, I'll go to Sunday school. If you let me out of here, I'll pay my tithe, maybe even 15%. I don't know. I'm trying to be funny, I guess. But I don't know what you would do, but I know what Peter did. Peter went to sleep. I'm not totally surprised by that. That's pretty common posture for Peter. Every time he turned around at whatever big event he was attending, Peter was off snoozing somewhere. On the Mount of Transfiguration, with God's blessings and Moses and Elijah, Peter was getting his ease. And Jesus had to wake him up afterwards. I think about the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was praying until his sweat became his drops of blood. Peter was asleep. He was a fisherman. And trying to get a breeze in his face, he just automatically went to sleep. Now, how did that grab you so far? The church prayed, Peter slept. How do you think the church should respond? Pray, sleep, ask, rest? Well, what was God's response? What did he do? Verse 7, the church was praying fervently. Suddenly the bright light in the cell, the angel came, stood before Peter, tapped him on the side, wake him up, get up, get up. The chains fell off. Get dressed, put on your sandals. Put your shoes on here, Peter. Let me help me. Here's your coat. Come on, let's get out of here now. That's an unbelievable text to me. <laughs> it really is. An angel will wake you up and have to urge you to get out of the jail. Chains of two soldiers. Angel tapping him on the shoulder. Well, anyway, the chains fell off. And verse 9, Peter left the cell following the angel and he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize what was really happening. They went by the first set of guards and the second and on out through and every door opened from that jail that he was in. And they walked a block or so down through there and suddenly the angel disappeared and there was Peter in the dark alone out of the jail. And all of a sudden, he realized God had done, some, had done, had performed for him something that was truly remarkable. His startled reflex kicked in. He didn't know it when he was walking out. Probably. He didn't know what was going on. He thought he was asleep, maybe. But God was working and delivered him. Now, out in the street, delivered, his startled reflex kicked in. He said, oh God, you've really done something big here. He's answered prayer. What can God do? I want you to ask yourself this question today. <clears throat> Simple question. Does God have the power to change the situation in my life right now that is causing me to be so defeated and discouraged? Can God really take the chains off our families? Our physical bodies, our finances, our marriages. Can he loose us until we can be free to trust him and believe him? You say, preacher, that was a long time ago. That one man in prison. Yeah, I've got problems I've been dealing with until they're systemic. And, and years of dysfunction. I've tried to change them. I've, I've prayed, I've fasted, I've come to the altar. I've asked God for help. And there are dynamics at work in my life you just don't understand. And God doesn't really do miracles anymore. <clears throat> Maybe just Bible time. Maybe that's what you're thinking today if you need a miracle. But I know all of that. But let me ask you, does God have the power to enter the fabric of our lives and make a difference? Does God have the power to change what's wrong about us today? Most of us in here probably are believers and Christians, so if I were to ask you to raise your hand, nearly everybody would raise your hand. Sure, God has a power. God's God. 
He can do what he wants to do. He can do what he needs to do. God can do that. I'm sure we would say that. But you know what I'm discovering? Deep down inside a lot of us, where no one else can really see, we don't believe that. And we're not happy about that. But the truth is, we have doubts that God can really make a difference in the situation we find ourselves in. I think people are hurting everywhere today, and I'm sure you're hurting in one way or another today. You have challenges, you've experienced loss of loved ones, you are experiencing sickness, you have all kinds of things that, that come within your framework of living that challenge you to your very soul. When Peter finally comes to himself and, and realized that God had really performed a miracle, that this really had changed, that something he'd been delivered, his startled reflex kicked in, sure enough. Reminds me of the old song, he was there all the time. He was there. So Peter, getting over being stunned, ran down through the dark streets toward John Mark's mother's home. I, I think he thought if anybody was having a prayer meeting, it would be John Mark's mom. So he began to try to make his way there, down the dark alleys, holding probably to the shadows. I mean, he'd just been let out of prison. He knocked on the door. You say, did he knock loud? Well, I don't know. I doubt it. I probably think he was doing that. I mean, this guy just got out of jail. I doubt if he was making too much commotion himself trying to get to the prayer meeting. Well, here at the church, they're busy fervently praying for God to deliver Peter. And Rhoda finally hears the door knock and goes to the door and Peter says, Rhoda, it's me, Peter, open the door. But you know, she's so excited, so startled, so shocked that God had really answered prayer. You know what she did? She ran back in the room and didn't open the door, didn't unbolt the door for Peter, didn't let him in. And she began to tell the others, Peter's out there. He's at the front door. And here was the church praying that Peter would be delivered He's at the door knocking, and yet he's not allowed to come in. You think I'm exaggerating, you look at verse 15 there along the way. Rhoda went in and she said, you're crazy. The others just said, you're out of your mind. We're trying to have a prayer meeting here. <laughs> Asking God to get us out of this mess. Earnestly pleading, God deliver but Rhoda said, he's free. He's on the front porch. Peter kept knocking. I think it's so ironic to think about the fact that along the way, we pray, we pray, we pray, and we pray, and we seek answers, and the answer is just outside the door if we would unlock our door of faith and allow it to come in. Maybe some of you this morning, you've been praying, you've been seeking God, you're earnest about it, you know there's a dilemma that you can't face in your own strength, and you've tried to turn it over to God, and God may be knocking at your heart's door this morning. And you know what? All we have to do is just open the door. Come in, God. Bring your answer to my life. Touch my spirit. Deliver me from this awful bondage. God's answer wants in the door. Well, when he finally got in, they were astonished. They were startled. One, this verse I'm reading said they, they just went wild. Peter had to calm them down. Well, I, I have to admit to you that I'm more like the prayer meeting people than Rhoda. There are times I've prayed in my life and read scriptures and promises and I couldn't see the fullness of God's plan. And, and sometimes he comes and actually answers my prayer. And I'm a bit surprised at times. Hope that doesn't bother you that I admit that. But along the way, 
the way God answers prayer sometimes is really startling to me in my life. Sometimes I'm so focused on how I think the answer should be that when he comes a different way around the side door, I, I'm just not prepared for the way he answers prayer. This morning, I want you to think about this for a moment. What is the most challenging situation? What person, what sickness, what circumstance, what addiction, what thing has kept you bound and chained in prison that looks so impossible? Does God have the power to change your situation? Will he when you pray? Yes. Will God always answer the way you think he should? No. But I promise you this, when we pray, when we pray earnestly, when we turn things over to God, if we ask him to take us beyond ourselves, he will say yes. He will sometimes say no, or he'll do it a different way. But God will answer prayer. This week I was reading a devotional from Friday's Reflecting God devotional. And the scripture from Romans 12.12 12 simply said, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. It's so hard to do all of that, isn't it? And of course, in this context, the word hope is a verb and more than a noun. It's an active thing. And then the old song came to my mind, Are you ever burdened with a little care? Does the cross you carry seem so heavy to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly, and it will keep you singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings. Name them one by one and it will surprise you. It might startle you to see what God has done. I appreciate the fact that in our church we have an open altar. These kneelers are more than just a part of the wood furniture for decoration. They're places where we pray. As I sat on the front seat and noticed some of you praying, I knew some of your needs, not many, but I didn't need to. But this morning, whatever's there, I want you to petition God for your need. If you have circumstance in your life and you don't think there's any way to overcome it, I want you simply to pray and invite God to come in a brand new way. I'm not going to labor this scripture longer. You had a wonderful message already illustrated to you today. But this scripture is full of simple illustrations of God moving in wonderful ways to his church and helping to, in every circumstance, in every situation. Peter was delivered he was startled. The church had prayed for his deliverance and they were startled. Are you willing to let God startle you today with his answer? God has an answer for your life. God has an answer for your challenge today. I want to pray for you this morning. Would you just bow your heads for me a moment? And I was touched by our pastor's prayer. Her heart melted as she prayed. And I believe you were too. And I think this morning, I want to specifically pray that God will bring deliverance and victory and challenge that's burdening your spirit right now. If you have such a need before I pray, would you like to just slip your hand up and say, please pray for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you all over the building. Heavenly Father, we're conscious of your presence here today. The beautiful praise, music, and singing, and instrumentation that we worshiped you and celebrated you. And our faith is built today as we've come together to worship. And now this scripture that we're all so very familiar with, 
Peter was in a most impossible circumstance. But God came in a, in a mighty way and delivered him. He didn't know what had taken place for a while. The church was praying fervently and earnestly, but they weren't fully prepared to receive the answer. They had the door locked and you were trying to get in with an answer. And Lord, if someone here right now has just given up hope or given up faith or felt like their circumstance is beyond any real help, oh God, may they open the door of their hearts. May every one of us today sense that you want to be with us just now to lift us, to deliver us, to give us strength, to give us faith, to give us the essence of your blessing and to help us, Lord, to know that you're at work and we can see your fingerprints on the very fabric of our lives as you work within us and challenge us today. Thank you for these few minutes we can share together on this Sunday morning. May it be the kind of blessing that will extend into tomorrow and the next day. And may you answer prayer for each person that raised their hand today with their several needs. We're thankful, Lord, that you understand the dynamics that are here. Even in this room just now, this beautiful room that here for our worship. Oh God, we lift our spirits to you. And now we want to count our blessings. We want to see what you've done. And we want you to surprise us, to help us understand how you answer prayer. We believe and we have faith, and we thank you for that answer just now. In Jesus' name, praise God. Okay.